Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 32. In this lecture, we'll discuss momentum and the conservation of momentum. These topics are covered in Chapter 9 of our textbook by Surway and Jouette. Let's begin with the definition of momentum. Momentum for a particle of mass m and velocity v is defined as mass times velocity. We use the letter p to denote momentum. We put an arrow over the letter p to remind ourselves that it's a vector, and therefore, like all vectors, it has a magnitude and an orientation, or it has x and y components. This vector is defined as the product of mass, which is a scalar, more specifically, it's a positive scalar, and the velocity vector. Remember that when you multiply a vector by a positive scalar, you're simply changing the size of that vector, but you're not changing its orientation. What that means is that the velocity vector and the momentum vector always point in the same direction. The momentum vector can be longer or shorter than the velocity vector, depending on what the mass is. If the mass is 5 kilograms, then the momentum vector is going to point in the same direction as the velocity vector, but it will be 5 times larger. If the mass is 0.2 kilograms, then velocity and momentum will point in the same direction, but momentum will be one-fifth the length of velocity. Notice that the definition of momentum is a relatively simple one, although um, applying momentum can be quite complicated and requires a fair bit of practice. We'll want to measure momentum and therefore we'll need units of measurement. The SI unit of momentum is the kilogram meter per second. That should make sense because mass is measured in kilograms and velocity is measured in meters per second. So the unit for momentum should be kilogram meters per second. There's no special name given to this particular combination of units. In physics, we usually like to use the name of uh, famous physicists like Newton or Joule or Watt. But in this case, for historical reasons, um, there is no special name given to this. So the unit for momentum is simply known as the kilogram meter per second. Now, technically, this definition here is for a point particle. And what that means is that this definition is applicable to a molecule or a single atom or to some object whose mass is sufficiently concentrated that it can be treated as a point particle. However, most everyday objects are not just single point particles. If you want to study the physics of a table or a chair or an airplane or even a tennis ball, you have to deal with more than one point particle. Even a tennis ball consists of billions of billions of atoms. So how do we calculate the momentum of a tennis ball? Well, we simply add the momentums of the individual particles. So uh, more formally, for a system consisting of n particles, the momentum of the system, written simply as p here, is the sum of the individual momenta. So the sigma letter here is denoting summation. P sub n is the momentum of the nth particle. So we're imagining that we have an object like a tennis ball with many, many atoms. We can label those atoms, at least theoretically we can, as atom 1, atom 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and we're going to use the letter n, lowercase n, as an index uh, referring to the label for each atom. So this symbol here is simply suggesting that we need to figure out the momentum of each individual atom or molecule and then add all of those together. If you have a billion atoms, then uppercase N or capital N would be a billion. In principle, each atom could have its own mass and its own velocity. So when you're calculating the momentum of the nth atom, you would need to know what the mass of that atom is and its velocity. You would take the product, figure out what the momentum for that atom is, do the same thing for the next atom and the next atom and the next atom, and then add those together to find the total momentum of the system. In some cases, this complicated expression simplifies. In particular, if all the particles have the same mass and velocity, then all of the m sub n's will be equal to each other and all of the v sub n's will be equal to each other. 
For example, if you have a solid metallic cube and it's entirely made of, let's say, iron atoms, then every one of those iron atoms is going to have the same mass. And if the solid cube is simply sliding across the floor with some constant velocity, then we can say that all of those iron atoms have the same velocity vector. They're all moving in the same direction at the same rate. In that case, this complicated summation simply becomes mass of one atom times the velocity of one atom, so that's the momentum of a single atom, times n, which is the number of atoms. This is uppercase n. And of course, the mass of a single atom times the number of atoms is the total mass of the system. So for this uniform iron cube that is sliding across the floor, we can just say the momentum is equal to the total mass times the velocity of the cube. These last two equations here are not very practical equations. Uh, in principle, we would never want to add, for example, a billion momenta. Their function here is really to familiarize you with the notation that we'll be using. So we'll be using this summation notation quite a bit going forward, so you should be familiar with it. And we will also distinguish between the mass of the system, as capital M written here, and the mass of the constituents of the systems, the components of the systems, like the atoms and molecules that make up the system, that mass is denoted as lowercase m here. So as we have seen, momentum is described as the product of mass and velocity. You might be wondering why momentum is defined in this particular way. You might be wondering why the product of mass and velocity is important or interesting to us. It turns out under the right circumstances, that particular combination of mass and velocity is conserved, and therefore it's a useful quantity. We've seen other examples of conserved quantities. For example, we know under the right circumstances, energy is conserved. And in particular, kinetic energy was defined as a combination of mass and velocity, specifically one half mv squared. Momentum serves a very similar purpose, although it's a vector quantity and therefore more complicated. As you will see in the next couple of lectures, we will be using momentum conservation in very much the same way that we use energy conservation. A little more precisely, the principle of momentum conservation states that in the absence of external interactions, the total momentum of a system is constant in time. So this is what we mean by momentum conservation. We mean that momentum does not change or it is constant in time. That doesn't happen all the time. It happens under the right circumstances. Specifically, what we need is the absence of external interactions. In this context, the absence of external interactions means that the sum of all of the external forces must be equal to zero. So imagine you have a system that you want to analyze. Could be a chair, could be an airplane, could be a tennis ball. There could be a multitude of forces acting on that system. For example, drag and friction and tension and weight could all be acting on the same system. Some of these forces might be internal forces. Some of the forces might be external forces. Here we're interested only in the external forces. If you're talking about an atom, for example, remember that an atom actually isn't just a monolithic object. It has components. It has a nucleus. It has electrons that are orbiting that nucleus. The force of the nucleus on the electrons is considered an internal force because it's one component of the system pushing or pulling another component of the system. However, if another atom comes along and, for example, attracts or repels the first atom, then we have an external force. That force of attraction between atom number two and atom number one becomes an external force because its source is something outside of the system. So what we're interested in are the external forces, not internal forces. And if the sum of those external forces is equal to zero, then we can say that momentum is conserved. Note that what is external and what is internal is a little bit subjective. More precisely, it depends on your definition of the system. So if you're studying the behavior of this apple, for example, uh, 
then its weight is an external force because the weight of the apple, in fact, is the force of planet Earth on the apple. And if your system is defined as the apple, then clearly the source of weight is somewhere outside of the system. So we refer to that as an external force. On the other hand, if your system is the apple and the earth together, for example, you might be studying the physics of earth along with everything else on earth, then the weight of the apple becomes an internal force because the force of the earth on the apple can be viewed as the force of one component of the system on another component of the system. In that case, you might decide that you want to consider the sun in which case the pull of the sun on planet Earth becomes an external force. On the other hand, you might say, well, I want to study the behavior of the entire solar system as one system, in which case the force of the sun on the Earth becomes an internal force. So this distinction between internal and external forces depends very much on the system that you're using, and you need to be vigilant about it. Also note that we are not saying that there cannot be external forces. We're simply saying that the external forces must add up to zero. For example, if our system is this apple, certainly there are external forces acting on it. Planet Earth is pulling the apple down. That's the weight of the apple. And also the floor is pushing the apple up. That's the normal force. Both of those are external forces when we view the apple as our system but they add up to zero, and therefore we can say that the, um, the apple is in the absence of external interactions, and therefore its momentum is conserved. As you will see, the principle of momentum conservation is an extremely important idea with many applications, and therefore we want to have a concise statement of this principle. Concisely, it says that if the sum of external forces is equal to zero, then P initial is equal to P final. So we have some system. The system is evolving, it's changing, it's moving in time. We're considering two moments in time. We're calling them initial and final. We can calculate the initial momentum of the system. And then a few seconds later, or maybe a few hours later, we can calculate the final momentum of the system. And when these two are equal to each other, we say that momentum is conserved. This happens when all of the external forces add up to zero. This same equation is sometimes written in other forms. So occasionally you see the same principle written as if the sum of external forces is equal to zero, then delta P is equal to zero. You understand this means the same thing. After, delta, after all, delta P is defined as P final minus P initial. So if you want, you can write conservation of momentum in this form. And then sometimes when we want to be a little more mathematically sophisticated, we'll write it as dp dt is equal to zero. So here we're saying the derivative of momentum with respect to time is zero. Of course, you understand when the, when the derivative of something is equal to zero, we're basically saying that thing is not changing. Specifically, if the derivative with respect to time is zero, then that quantity, momentum, is not changing with respect to time. So this is just another way of saying that momentum is conserved. You'll see all three versions of the principle of momentum conservation, and you need to be comfortable in using all three versions. They're all essentially stating the same thing. I should also mention that when the sum of external forces is equal to zero, we sometimes describe the system as quote unquote isolated. So when we talk about an isolated system in this context, that means that the sum of all the external forces is equal to zero, and therefore the momentum of the system is conserved. Momentum and momentum conservation are fundamental ideas in physics, so they are interesting from a purely theoretical point of view. But they're also interesting because they can help us solve many practical applications. Momentum in some ways is similar to energy, and therefore uh, it can be used in the same way that energy conservation is used. More specifically, momentum helps us uh, relate initial conditions to final conditions. So if we know the initial momentum, 
of a system, we can use momentum conservation to find the final momentum of the system. And what that usually means is that we can figure out the final velocity of the system using momentum conservation. A little more precisely, you will see that many momentum conservation problems essentially follow this four-step recipe. Now, this might be an oversimplification of momentum problems, but in some sense, all momentum problems essentially boil down to these four steps. You will begin by choosing your system carefully. Remember that if you want to use momentum conservation, the system must, must be isolated. So you have to kind of decide if the system is just the apple, or is it just the earth, or is it the apple and the earth together. Then you must choose the initial time to be when all velocities are known. So the idea is we want to relate initial to final, and we would want the initial time to be a moment in time when we have the maximum amount of information about the problem. In particular, we want to know all the velocities so that we can calculate the momentums. And then finally, if we have chosen our system carefully to be an isolated system, we can write down an equation for momentum conservation, p initial is equal to p final. Since we know all the initial velocities, we should be able to calculate the initial momentum of the system, and that gives us the final momentum of the system. And lastly, we remember that the final momentum of the system is equal to mass times velocity. In most cases, we assume that the mass does not change, and this equation allows us to figure out the final velocity. To really understand this four-step procedure, you have to do a lot of practice problems, but keep these four steps in mind as you work through your homework assignments. Let's wrap up this lecture with a relatively simple problem involving the conservation of momentum. A cannon resting on frictionless ice fires a projectile parallel to the surface. The cannon recoils backward while the projectile moves forward. The cannon and the projectile have masses of 2,100 kilograms. If the projectile has a speed of 5 meters per second, find the speed of the cannon immediately after it has fired. So to begin with, what we have is a cannon and a projectile inside the cannon, so the cannonball. Once the cannon is fired, the projectile will move forward, we can say in the positive x direction, and its speed is given to us, 5 meters per second, but simultaneously the cannon itself will recoil, it will move backwards in the negative x direction. Now the cannon is obviously much heavier than the cannonball, so it will not move with the same speed, but we want to know exactly what speed it has as it recoils backwards. Note that we're not really interested in the long-term behavior of the projectile. We know that once the projectile leaves the cannon, um, it will follow a parabolic path. We can use the kinematic uh, equations to figure out its time of flight. We can figure out where it lands. We're not really interested in that portion of this problem right now. So we can already handle the projectile motion. For this particular problem, we're really interested in a very brief period of time surrounding the firing of the cannon. So what we're really interested in is from one millisecond before the cannon is fired to one millisecond after the cannon is fired. We're really interested in that period of time when the projectile is moving through the nozzle of the cannon. For now, we don't really care what happens after that. Note that some of the old tools that you have will not help you solve this problem. You cannot use the kinematic equations to analyze the motion of the projectile inside the nozzle because there are complicated forces acting on it. For projectile motion, you can only have the force of gravity acting on the object, while the projectiles inside the cannon, we have complicated explosive forces resulting from the ignition of gunpowder. We don't really understand those forces, at least that information is not given to us in this problem, and therefore we cannot use conservation of energy either. We don't really know how much energy is released as gunpowder is ignited. We could turn that into a separate problem in its own right, but here none of that information is given to us.
Momentum conservation, on the other hand, will be useful to us. In part because these complicated explosive forces that we're talking about can be viewed as internal forces. So here our choice of system matters quite a bit. If I choose the system of interest to be just the projectile, then it's clearly not an isolated system. While it's inside the nozzle, there is the force of the cannon on the projectile pushing it out, the explosive force of the gunpowder to be more specific. If I consider the cannon by itself as my system, then it too cannot be an isolated system because there's the force of the projectile on the cannon. Remember, according to Newton's third law of motion, we have a reaction for every action. So as the cannon pushes the projectile out in the forward direction, the projectile will push the cannon backwards in the negative x direction. So the cannon by itself cannot be viewed as an isolated system either. However, if I view the whole thing as a system, the cannonball and the cannon, then I have an isolated system. Sure, there is weight, but that's being balanced by the normal force. And because, strangely, we've put this whole thing on ice, there is no friction. So the cannon and the projectile together can be viewed as an isolated system, and therefore the momentum will be conserved. And because the momentum is conserved, we can use that fact to figure out the final velocity of the cannon. We can do that in the following manner. So first we'll calculate the initial momentum of the system in the x direction. So P I X refers to the momentum of the whole system. Remember the system is the cannon and the projectile. And we're talking about the initial momentum of the system. And specifically we're talking about the X momentum. Remember that momentum is a vector. A little bit later we'll talk about Y components and also Z components. Now, momentum, of course, is mass times velocity, but our system consists of two pieces or two components. So I'll have to add the momentum of piece one to the momentum of piece two. So mass of the cannon times velocity of the cannon initially in the x direction plus mass of the projectile times velocity of the projectile initially in the x direction. Now, when I say initial, what I really mean is a millisecond or perhaps a nanosecond before the cannon is fired. Before the cannon is fired, nothing was moving. The velocity of the cannon was zero. The velocity of the projectile was zero. So we can say that the momentum of the system was zero. What about a nanosecond after the projectile is fired? Now we need to calculate P final in the X direction. This is momentum of the system after the cannon is fired. The system consists of two pieces or two components. So we'll have to calculate the momentum of each piece separately and add them together. We have mass of the cannon, which we know to be 2000. We have the velocity of the cannon final, which is the thing we're interested in finding. So this is the recoil velocity of the cannon. And then we have mass of the projectile, which is 100 kilograms. And we're told that the projectile comes out of the nozzle, it is fired, with a speed of 5 meters per second. So now we have 200, sorry, 2000 V plus 500. Momentum conservation tells us that the initial momentum of zero must equal to the final momentum. So we set these two equal to each other. And we solve for our only unknown, which is the final velocity of the cannon, and we find that the velocity of the cannon, finally, that is after being fired in the x direction, is equal to minus 0.25 meters per second. As you can see, the cannon recoils with a smaller speed than the projectile. That makes sense. The projectile will move forward much faster. It is a lighter object. Also, as you can see, if you do the algebra carefully, you will get a minus sign in front, and that supports the fact that the cannon is recoiling. The cannon is moving in the negative x direction, and therefore its x velocity ought to be a negative number. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.